This is Twit. Okay, so we've all seen video segments of complex manufacturing facilities where thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cans or, you know, something, bottles or boxes or whatever, are moving through a complex system that's sorting and spinning and stamping and printing or counting or or whatever it's doing. You know, like these crazy-looking manufacturing facilities. Um, You know, treadmills and and gates opening and closing, routing stuff. I love that stuff. It's one of the things I love on TikTok is there's a a bunch of TikTok videos of how stuff's made. It's always fascinating. Always fascinating. Very cool. Yeah. So just as some of those pre-electronics early computers used banks of mechanical relays, you know, back before the advent of computers, process control engineers, as they're called, would design insanely complex control systems built up from individual mechanical relays. We would call such a system discrete as opposed to integrated. Then, blessedly, integrated electronic solutions became cost-effective And these large process control solutions were replaced by PLC systems, programmable logic controllers. These PLCs were not very smart because they didn't need to be. Basically, they were replacing a bunch of relays. You know, they were essentially, if A, then B, wait until C, then do D, and once E, go back to the start. But being solid state they were at least more reliable. Now, remember that we have the term of a hardware or software bug because back in 1947, a dead moth, you know, a bug, was found to be the underlying cause of Harvard's Mark II relay computer not working correctly. Anyway, you know, relays are not as reliable as solid state because... You know, they can actually have bugs. Anyway, we've talked about these PLCs um, on this podcast multiple times because attaching them to the Internet has turned out to be a generally really bad idea. They were never designed for that, and it hasn't been turning out well. I'm bringing all this up today because I received a long, insightful, and interesting direct message from a listener whose thoughts about the problems with PLCs are worth sharing. Here's what Dylan wrote. He said, good day. I'm an engineer and occasionally work with programmable logic controllers. And I have some thoughts on why these sadly make the news in a bad way. Sometimes I believe most of the problems boil down to two root causes. Number one, Increased demand for real-time data. Just like the CAN bus protocol in the automotive industry, PLCs were invented and took hold in manufacturing when security was not a concern. As time went on, protocols were developed to have PLCs talk to each other and to advanced peripherals like motor controllers, touchscreens, printers, or even SCADA supervisory control and data acquisition computers. I believe the demand for telemetry and data aggregation is the real reason most PLCs get exposed, not because remote WAN side control is needed or used. I have experienced this. Management wants to know how many widgets were produced how fast they were produced, how many passed QC, was there downtime, was it planned, are there idle shift hours, is one shift of operators more efficient than another, and on and on and on. He says, I don't need or want to remotely access a PLC and a machine to change anything about it. It has done the same job over and over and over correctly for a decade. But the data the PLC can store and transmit is the reason it's connected to a network and pulled every 15 minutes for new numbers. 
to satisfy this need, PLC manufacturers are building in web servers, SQL light databases, TCP IP stacks, and a lot of things that have no business being attached to a device based on 1960s technology that has no provision for security. Again, going back to the automotive comparison, the inventors of CAN bus at Robert Bosch Company could not have imagined cars would be driving down the road with IP addresses connected to a global network all the time and would have security flaws that let anyone observe and change CAN bus communications inside the vehicle. And then he says, number two, security conscious staff are not involved with PLCs. Even though many consider PLCs to be outdated, at the end of the day, they are exactly like an Arduino or similar microcontroller. They store a program that is executed in a loop at high speed and the code is evaluated every scan through the ladder logic. And just a quick plug. They do this for decades in terrible environments with noisy electrical signals and with fantastic circuit protections. Reverse the polarity on your, on your Arduino and you're going to Amazon to shop for another one. Reverse the polarity on a PLC, not a darn thing happens. You'll realize you made a stupid mistake, flip the polarity back, and everything works. Anyway, he says, the people who program these are aging out. And I suspect globally fewer people know how to program ladder logic than did 20 years ago. I'm 36, and I learned to program them 15 years ago, but it seems I'm in the minority in my age group amongst peers in my industry. My observation is this. IT people don't understand or want to understand PLCs and PLC programmers have no incentive or instruction to make the devices secure. IT staff doesn't consult with the programmers to tell them what security practices they should follow or review the final configuration of the PLC. Conversely, the programmer just needs the machine to work, and they're probably fighting numerous mechanical, electrical, and pneumatic problems while completing the programming and <laughs> those yeah, pneumatic you know, problems, we had, a, we had a pneumatic problem. Do, That's why do I didn't not get the code underestimate working. those. They can be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want a problem mm -hmm. with your air pressure. No, any extra changes could break the house of cards they've been building. Imagine everything seems to be working, but all that remains is a communication problem. Some PLCs have manuals. 700 to 1,000 pages long, and various communication features are scattered throughout the PDF. No organization there. An inexperienced programmer engineer who's under pressure to compete the already late project might just start turning everything on, even if they don't know what it is oh. or what the risks are. Require authentication? Nah uncheck that box that could be the problem max number of connections equal one well i don't know what counts and what doesn't so let's just set it to 10 set admin password better make sure that's blank or default you know don't want to you know don't want to keep something from connecting oh and don't change the port number that other device over there might be assuming the default port is used and we don't want to break something that works now and lose ground he says honestly i don't even think we ever are going to fix this either industries will eventually move to more advanced systems which is already happening in some cases like pc-based control with national instruments lab view or their competitors or existing older plcs just need to be kept in a dmz or well-guarded network segment the trouble is when things aren't broke they don't get fixed so already exposed or at-risk PLCs are just going to be sitting there 
connected to networks to harvest data, waiting to be leveraged for attacks. And these are the things that keep massive swaths of our public utilities functioning. So, Dylan, I think you got all of that exactly right. And I've said it before. I'm sure this won't be the last time I say it. This podcast has amazing listeners. No kidding. So thank you, Dylan. There's something cool about PLCs. What? How? Is it kind of writing an assembly language to write to one? Or, or uh, maybe? yeah, it's a very low level. Okay. Yeah, uh, 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 tree logic. So it's literally if A then B. Wow. If not, or or wait this long, then trigger this. I mean, it is it is the thing that moves the arms back and right, forth. Right. Right. You know, in, in those assembly lines. I'm sure there are high level interfaces though to see, or you know, Fourth was originally designed to do that to program those things. Uh, well, Fourth was designed to aim a radio telescope. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I imagine the aiming mechanism was something like a PLC. It was, it was definitely, you know, turn motor on, right. wait till star right. moves to center, turn motor exactly. off. Yeah, Charles Moore, yeah. Yep. Oh, I love this stuff. It's kind, There's something cool about putting your code in a hardware device. Well, Leo... It's it's a robot. Robots yeah. are cool. Very so cool. So it's cool. Yeah. It's cool about I mean like the, the the way to motivate you know grade schoolers is is if rem, 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 yes. remember logo was the original yep. the you know turtle Go logic. 12. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, start is a great way for high school students to get into robotics. The start competition. That's yeah. You're yeah. right. That's cool. Yeah. I, I I think the idea and and I think also that's where. Uh, what is that world that you create? Oh, Lego blocks thing? Yeah, no, yeah, the, Roblox. Uh, yeah, Roblox. They're absolutely learning that kind of logic in Roblox. Yep. Exactly what they're learning, yeah. Man, I wish I, you know, I would... I wish I had another 50 or 60 years. I'd like to really get into some of this stuff. Very cool. Hey, it's Leo Laporte. I hope you've enjoyed this little snippet from Security Now. If you want the whole show, you can get it at our website, twit.tv slash SN. Of course, you can subscribe to Security Now on your favorite podcast or just click one of the links below.